can talk about food a lot. I have a yeah. conversation with Dr. So Elizabeth Arnold from topic. Grand Valley State University um, in Michigan. Dr. Arnold uh, speaks about I'm food and culture and how it's related so from the perspective of an anthropologist. Past. Um, but I'm also an environmental archaeologist, so you can imagine that um, a lot of the things I talk about in the past are relevant to our conversations about environment today. And if we're talking about food, Food is clearly relevant, um, both in terms of the past and in terms of the present. Um, the big part about anthropology is a discussion of culture. And so culture is one of these words that we use pretty regularly in our vocabulary, but we don't necessarily think about what the definition might be. Um, but I'm going to give you a pretty basic definition of culture. And it's this collection of learned behaviors practiced by a particular group of people. And so the key part about culture is that it's learned behavior. So the part here is learned behavior. And so we can think of all the ways we learn our behavior. And it starts very, very early when we're born and in our family, our parents teach us what to do. Our um, peers teach us what to do as you go to school, various teachers, other people in your community. And I, I use this definition because it says a particular group of people, because we can talk about what that group might be. So for example, we can talk about Canadian culture versus American culture. And initially I might admit that I would say, oh, Canadians and Americans are both basically the same. Mm. Having lived in both places, they are not. There are some very key differences between um, Canadians and Americans, right? But we can at the same time also talk about Western culture or North American culture. So we can go to very big groups and we can go to smaller groups. If you're thinking about your campus community, for example, right, we can think about, um, you know, the connections you have within that particular group of people and what perhaps some of the cultures are there. And so I teach at Grand Valley State University and I really love this example of culture because it happened um, right on our campus. And so a couple of years ago, probably not a couple anymore, um, about 10 years ago, um, we built a new library on campus. And our old library, um, we're not a particularly big university, we're not a particularly old university. And so the original library building was one of the original buildings to the campus. And the sort of unofficial culture of the library was that on the fourth floor was the quiet workspace. And so if you wanted to work in groups or be loud and chatty with your friends, you were not welcome on the fourth floor. And it was sort of unofficially enforced by all of the students who worked on the fourth floor. Fourth floor was quiet space. Well, then we built this new library. It's much, much bigger. It's a very nice building. And the architects decided that there would be two sides to the, each space. So, and they were color coded. So the red sort of orange coded spaces were work group spaces, i.e. loud spaces. And the blue colored spaces were quiet workspaces, but they divided the each floor in half so that each floor had a quiet space and a loud space. Well, that didn't go over very well with the Grand Valley student body because they were like, the fourth floor is quiet space. And so if you were in the orange space on the fourth floor and being chatty and group work and whatnot, mm, it was like a big deal. Students were like, this is the culture of the library. The fourth floor is quiet space. We don't care what the architects decided. This is the culture of the community. And so it was a really interesting, like very, and it became quite a topic on campus. And so, you know, you learn this behavior from older students on campus. And now, you know, the building has been around for 10 years or more. And that's the the pattern of behavior. So it's quite an interesting sort of phenomena. And we can talk about culture, lots of conversations about culture and anthropology. The first thing I used to say about culture is that it's distinctly human. And now you'll see that there's a little asterisk there. Because as we do more research, mainly on non-human primates, orangutans, chimpanzees, gorillas, even other animals, they might have some culture of their own, something that's transmitted through learning, customs and behaviors that govern our behavior and our beliefs. So it's perhaps not distinctly human anymore. Why do you send your kids to preschool? It's so that they learn not to hit people, right? And not to bite people, because that's generally, you know, part of culture. Don't bite people, don't throw sand, right? Um, all of those sorts of things.
And the other thing that I want to sort of bring up when I think about um, culture is this idea of ethnocentrism. And so ethnocentrism is something we are all guilty of um, in various forms. And we should be aware of it and try to uh, try to deal with it, but at least be aware of it. And so the idea of ethnocentrism is to look at your own culture as the normal and natural thing to do, and then look at other cultures as um, wrong. You know, So if we were thinking about this in terms of food, I have young children. So, you know, that I have served them food and they have said, that's gross, that's disgusting. And I'm like, <laughs> um, but, you know, if you travel to another country and you see people or you're served food and it's something you're like, mm, not familiar with, you might be like, oh, that's gross. I don't want to eat that. How could they think that um, was good, right? And we can think of that in a variety of ways. It might be the way things are prepared it might be, uh, so for example, poutine, distinctly Canadian dish, revolting in my opinion. But I will admit that my personal bias is because I hate gravy in all forms. So really, if you're gonna put gravy on anything, I'm not gonna be a fan. And in fact, the only time I've ever sent something back in a restaurant is because they put gravy on my mashed potatoes when I specifically asked not to have gravy on my mashed potatoes. And gravy is the kind of thing you can't pick off. Like if you put tomatoes on my pizza and I'm not happy with it, I'll just pick those off and go on with it. You can't pick off gravy, right? So we want to be aware of this idea of ethnocentrism. And this, um, it happens often when we travel because you're exposed to all of these new sorts of things. And, they, and we need to think about perhaps some of the words we would use to describe, um, you know, differences in other cultures. So my mom was famous for saying, uh, you know, when I was a little kid and I would say, oh, that's weird. You know, I'd see somebody doing something. I said, that's weird. And my mom would always say, not weird, just different. Right. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Not weird, just different. So um, when we think about sort of the broader context of um, food, culture, environment, um, what's particularly interesting to anthropologists is how adaptable we are to all of this you know, stuff in our world. And so here's a second sort of second definition of um, culture that I use when I teach culture and environment um, that I particularly like as an adaptive system for coping with the environment, because we have to do that. And arguably we do that more and more with climate change and an adaptive system for coping with each other, coping with each other. I'm like, hmm, that's perhaps even more relevant during the pandemic when you're all stuck at home with family members all day long. When we come to food, right? Um, go well back into the past here and think about um, the challenge of getting food within our environment. Um, there's lots of ways that humans um, get food within their environment. And as I say, I'm an archaeologist, so I'm going to go very far back in the past here um, for a little bit. But we get food with a variety of biological adaptations. So remember that um, I started our definition of anthropology is studying humans in all of our biological and cultural um, complexity. Thinking about cultural diversity, we have lots of cultural adaptations for how we do food. And you talked about um, cooking food. Um, we can think about pottery, for example. Archaeologists uh, tend to talk about pottery quite a lot, mostly because it survives really well in the archaeological record. Pottery is a really interesting cultural adaptation because clearly it's about cooking food, but it's also about storing food, um, transporting food, and it's also got, um, part of the reason anthropologists and archaeologists really like to talk about pottery is because it also, you know, has various cultural elements to it, how you decorate pottery and how you shape pottery pottery and who makes pottery and who uses pottery and who owns pottery and all of those sorts of things. Lots of cultural adaptations. And of course, we do it in a variety of environments, right? If we're thinking about the world sort of prior to massive globalization, massive mobility of populations, we can talk about um, cultures in sort of distinct environments. And so more than any other animal in the world, no species thrives in as many environments as we do. And since you guys are all in Ottawa, you understand what this winter looks like. So if we talk uh, very basically about sort of subsistence strategies, we can actually characterize 
how humans get food into sort of five basic categories. Foraging, what you perhaps have heard of as hunting and gathering. Foraging is sort of the broader term for that. And we could talk about horticulture as being slightly different from agriculture. Um, and then also think about agriculture or pastoralism, that real focus on animals. And then what we're most familiar with in our modern world and certainly in North America is the industrial um, food system, which we can have all sorts of critiques about as well. Up until about 10,000 years ago, everybody was a forager. Um, everybody was a hunter gatherer. This is how um, we got food. And so everybody relied on the natural resources within their environment for subsistence. And so it mattered what grew in your environment. Some people have focused on this as the ideal um, subsistence pattern uh, for humans to be eating, a hunting and gathering um, sort of lifestyle. And um, you've perhaps heard of the paleo diet, which focuses on this. I have all sorts of terrible things to say about the paleo diet um, in that I'm not a fan um, for a variety of reasons, um, but mostly because if you are trying to emulate a hunter-gatherer in diet, you can't do that in a globalized world because, of course, you have access to all sorts of fruits and vegetables you wouldn't necessarily have had in your restricted additional hunting and gathering um, environment. But we did this for a long time. Humans did this for a very long time. When we talk about hunting and gathering communities, we can talk about, you know, some of the social impacts that happened in that traditionally and broadly, there are exceptions, men are hunters and women are gatherers. And this has um, caused some um, impressions about how we talk about hunting and gathering communities. So man the hunter, women the gatherer. And man the hunter often was what was emphasized and that hunting was the key part of this diet. And part of the reason for that is, well, when you think about the tools that we use for hunting, stone tools, right, that were our projectile points and our knives, those survive very well in the archaeological record. So it's easy for archaeologists to find them and talk about them. Whereas the tools that women use for gathering, nets, digging sticks, etc., those are organic and they don't preserve as well in the archaeological record. And so they aren't found and aren't emphasized and talked about. And so we often talk about this in archaeology as the hardware of that men, tools that men would have used and the software, right? Um, and it's also a bias in the discipline that the majority of archaeologists, even today, are male and so talked about the male part of the equation. Whereas now that cultural anthropologists have gone out and studied many living hunting and gathering communities, because there are still communities that live this traditional means, um, about 80% or more of the diet actually comes from gathering of foods and the meat component is quite minimal. I mean, that is different depending on what community we're in. Um, in the far north um, Arctic populations, the majority of the diet is meat. <laughs> so um, simply because there is no vegetation. So, um, but all of these, you know, depending on what environment you're in, depends on the kind of things that, um, how your hunting and gathering community will look like. So for example, I mentioned Arctic hunters, focusing on these very large herd animals. There's not a lot of variety because it's a, um, less biodiverse um, area and there's very little vegetarian vegetation um, and in fact some of the only greens that come in the um, arctic um, diet are from the stomach contents of reindeer as they eat um, the lichen and so my ethnocentric bias makes me kind of go mm, that's not salad um, and not really something i would care to partake in. But if you want your greens, that's what you're going for. I mean, think of it like a green smoothie, maybe. Um, whereas in tropical foraging communities, right, we have much bigger biodiversity, greater number of species, both in plants and animals. And so the diet might be a little bit more um, diverse and um, varied. So, you know, this is how our environment can um, impact us. When we think about now, 10,000 years ago is sort of the um, key number we use to talk about the origins of agriculture. 
Um, but that depends on where we are in the world. So broadly, um, in the old world, in sort of the cradle of civilization, or what we would call the Fertile Crescent, and you can see the map here of the Tigris and the Euphrates, um, modern day Iraq and into um, Syria and Israel, Palestine. This is where agriculture originated, um, both plant and animal domestication um, initially. And so we call this the Fertile Crescent. And then of course it spreads into various other countries. And so one of the original ideas about agriculture from anthropologists and archeologists was, oh, this is such a great idea. Like it was discovered in the Fertile Crescent. Everyone's like, oh, this is such a great idea. We should start doing this. Um, and then it spread everywhere. And the dates kind of held up to that idea of spread. Um, but we now recognize that, first of all, agriculture was not a great idea and that it has many independent origins um, throughout the world. So it's an independent origin in China. It's definitely an independent origin in the new world. And it focuses on slightly different crops. So in the old world, we would talk about wheat and barley as the first domesticated plants. Um, cattle, sheep, and goat as the first domesticated animals. Where in Mesoamerica, we're talking about corn, um, very few domestic animals. In fact, uh, the turkey is the only animal domesticated in North America. Um, yay, Thanksgiving. Um, and um, llamas, alpacas, and guinea pigs in um, South America, all delicious, I might add. Um, and so these sorts of things change. So the idea of agriculture as sort of a grand idea um, is one that we can dispel. Um, it's likely that agriculture started as a means to try to continue um, a hunting and gathering way of life under environmental changes. So you can imagine yourself, for example, as being a hunter gatherer um, in the Fertile Crescent and you are mobile within your landscape and you come to the space where you normally would have um, exploited, gathered wild barley. And it had been a particularly dry year, something in terms of environmental changes. And you're like, oh, there's not nearly as much um, barley here as we would normally have. That's a bit of a concern. This is a important resource for us. And so you might think, hmm, well, before we leave, let's take out from this space all of the plants that are not barley in an effort to have more barley the next time we come back. That's a very small behavioral change that is about how can I preserve this patch of barley for when I come back next year? And then you come back next year, or next season, or whenever you come back, and you're like, hey, that kind of worked. Let's do that again, right? And so you haven't become an agriculturalist. You have simply, you've weeded, right, which is an agricultural practice, but you haven't become an agriculturalist. You are still a hunter and gatherer who is trying to um, impact, you know, bolster your production of resources. And so you can imagine over many generations that small practice becoming more and more intensive. Wow, that really worked, let's do that again. Um, and then you might say, hey, well, you know, it's we've been doing this for X number of years. I'm not gonna leave this time because I've done all this work. Somebody else might come and um, take this barley from me, right? And suddenly you've become a sedentary group in the landscape. And now that you're sedentary, you can do things like um, do more work in the landscape. And you can do things like have your children closer together because you don't have to carry them around when you um, are hunter and gatherer. So it's probably the origins of agriculture are now seen as perhaps not a great idea and more of a gradual shift in how we worked. So you might be familiar with the author, Jared Diamond. He's written books like Guns, Germs, and Steel and Collapse. And I have both positive and negative things to say about him, but I assign this article to my, to several of my classes. And he calls a revisionist view of agriculture. And he characterizes agriculture as the worst mistake in the history of the human race. Wow, that's a pretty strong statement about agriculture. And so um, I perhaps um, am against just how forceful this title is, but he raises some good points, right? In that we think about 
agriculture as being this great innovation that humans accomplished 10,000 years ago. And one of the things he does in this article, and I've given you just a small quote of it, is that um, he looks at some of the evidence that says, well, actually, agriculture wasn't so great. And so this um, quote here talks about how average height of hunter gatherers, and if we think about height as a general proxy for health, hunter gatherers were much taller than the earliest agriculturalists. And he goes on to say, um, there's a lot more evidence for diseases and cavities and all sorts of things. And that's true in that agriculture probably did have some pretty negative impacts um, in the very early stages, right? Less dietary diversity, all of those sorts of things. If we're looking at agriculture today, modern agriculture, clearly we're feeding a lot more people than the world had 10,000 years ago. So it's actually, um, as I say, I teach a class called Culture and Environment, and we often have lots of discussions about how to deal with impacts of climate change. And we always end up discussing, um, you know, well, we should go back to the way things were. And, you know, that's kind of a ridiculously vague statement. But if we think about going all the way back to being hunter gatherers, there's a whole lot of people on the planet that have to leave because we simply cannot support the kind of population we have now in a hunter gatherer lifestyle, right? So it's not really a solution. Um, and I think it is perhaps important to be critical of agriculture. And we, of course, can be critical of our industrial agricultural system, um, but it's not really a solution. So the one thing that, um, Diamond does do very well is that there's this quote from Thomas Hobbes that said, life is nasty, brutish, and short, um, which sounds terrible. Um, but for a long time, there was this um, assumption that hunter-gatherers' lives were nasty, brutish, and short, in that they spent all of their time um, searching for enough food. Um, and Diamond's analysis and others has said, well, actually, hunter-gatherers only really spend about two to four hours in a day searching for foraging, hunting, and gathering. And the rest of the time is spent in leisure. Well, I don't know about you, but four hours of work a day and the rest of my time spent in leisure sounds pretty good, right? As opposed to within the industrial agricultural system where farmers would easily work from sunup to sundown, right? So there is this sort of revision of how we perhaps pictured that hunter-gatherer lifestyle. And I don't know, perhaps the paleo diet is doing that too and sort of glorifying this um, lifestyle. But the process of domestication, origins of agriculture, very slow process. As I say, you know, over generations this happened. And so I'm not sure if you know, but the um, wild ancestor of corn is here on the left as Teosinte. And of course you will see modern, what looks mostly like modern corn on the right. And mm, those two plants do not look at all alike. And so the process to take what was a wild grass, Teosinte, to what we recognize today as corn, many, many generations. Um, and so really um, thinking about this origin of agriculture, the process of domestication in whatever plant we're talking about or whatever animal we're talking about um, was a very, very slow thing. So it's not some grand idea um, that we had. So as we move into agriculture and horticulture, we actually start with horticulture, which is really just a non-industrial um, plant cultivation. So simple tools, we aren't permanently cultivating the fields. Fields lie fallow for a particular um, period of time before we get in sort of industrial agriculture. Much more labor continuously, um, intensively used. We start to see domesticated animals as traction animals, plows, irrigation, terracing. And when we think about horticulture and agriculture, these are really just sort of two ends of a continuum, how intensively um, you're using your agricultural um, land, right? And this is perhaps the one we are most familiar with. Even if there are hunters in the group, um, I'm going to guess that that's perhaps not your main source of food. Um, you're probably still heading off to Safeway periodically. And so, of course, pastoralists primarily rely on their animals for their subsistence base and trade with neighbors for agricultural products, may do a little bit of hunting and gathering, may cultivate um, some grain, but really are defined by 
um, their animals. And so I mentioned previously, I worked in South Africa, the modern Zulu people, Bantu people are very much pastoralists. They define themselves as pastoralists. And if you speak to an individual who currently might not own any cattle, would still define himself as a cattle owner. Mm -hmm. And so it really is a key part of um, identity um, in terms of um, culture. And then, of course, we can think of, as I say, the one we're most familiar with, our industrial agricultural system. And as I say, I teach a whole class, perhaps critiquing our industrial agricultural system. And we might see, um, you know, we can associate this with a variety of ills in our world, pesticide use, um, herbicide use, fast food. And you perhaps are familiar with the idea of the slow food movement. So I googled slow food movement and I got all of these sorts of wondrous pictures of look how happy we are in the garden and we're making pasta together and there's these community tables where we're all going to share and you know of course in the idea of or in the time of COVID the idea of us all eating from the same plate might make you kind of crazy this is the slow you should sit down with people and eat food not in your car from the drive through at Wendy's um, which incidentally recently I was forced to do because of course I needed some food and um, restaurant wasn't open, only the drive-thru was open. So I ate Wendy's in my car and I was like, wow, this was really unsatisfying for a variety of reasons. <clears throat> Keep in mind when we talk about subsistence patterns, we're talking about their main activity and we all sort of engage in a variety of activities. So as I say, we might all be in the industrial food system right now, but some people might be hunting. Some people might have a garden and be gathering in their backyard. I dream of said backyard, but it's not happening just yet. And so the question I might have for you then is what is your subsistence strategy? How do you define yourself as food? And this is particularly interesting in an international cuisine class. What is your subsistence strategy? So we can talk about food and culture and the sort of um, traditions we use. And so I um, like to use Indian food as, a, as an example because food, culture, traditions of India have all been shaped by history, geography, and greatly influenced by different travelers, different rulers, right? We can talk about um, colonialism um, in India. I read an article the other day that was tea if by land and chai if by sea. Um, so whether you refer to it as tea depends on whether your culture received tea through land trade, but you refer to it as chai if you received tea into your culture through sea trade. And of course, India um, was a sort of key focus of both of those, um, those trading routes, right? So lots of influences coming from India. And food in many cultures, and also certainly in Indian culture, but in all cultures, plays a very important role in everyday life, as well as in festival. The idea that families sit down to eat, right? Lots of accompaniments, chutneys, mm, favorite, pickles, all of these sorts of things, rice, roti, various desserts. Food is not just important for eating, but as a way of socializing, getting together with family and friends, etc. And so Indian food is not you know, the only culture, cultural food that does this, right? We can think about how this applies within Italian food, for example. I might be a little bit critical about how this might apply in American food. <laughs> Broadly, you know, America's um, often defined by fast food. And as I was searching various images and material to put into this lecture, um, I did find a great infographic of what McDonald's looks like in various other cultures, because there's a shift to each particular culture as McDonald's comes into Japan, for example, or comes into India, for example. But my current project is in Israel and um, there's McDonald's is kosher. So cheeseburgers are out and bacon doesn't happen, right? So, I mean, these are sort of subtle shifts in sort of the fast food culture. And it's perhaps why the slow food movement has gained such traction in the United States, because it's a real reaction to fast food, right? And of course, Indian cuisine differs from region to region, various um, ethnic diversity within the subcontinent. But there's also sort of um, unifying threads in terms of particular spices that are used and um, what 
create certain um, elements of a dish and um, all of these sorts of things, right? We can talk about curry. Now, ooh, so I was reading a book set in the UK and um, the author defined, or the character in the book defined curry as sort of the quintessential um, UK food. And it was like, okay, but British food is terrible and curry is delicious. <laughs> um, and, but that's a real import and a characterization of the current population of the of Britain rather than some of the past um, histories because mushy peas really just don't cut it. Um, so again, if we're thinking about our own culture, our own subsistence pattern, Thanksgiving is a really great example um, for something that's uh, particularly North American. As I say, there is our, our one domesticated animal of North America, the turkey. Because I am both Canadian and American, I celebrate both Thanksgiving. And I always do that in class where, you know, middle of October, I say to my students, oh, hey, I'm celebrating Thanksgiving this weekend because um, it's Canadian Thanksgiving. And the students are all kind of stunned that I get to. And they say, well, what's different? between Canadian Thanksgiving and American Thanksgiving. And I was like, it's earlier. <laughs> like it's in October and it's celebrated on a Monday as opposed to Thursday. And they're like, why is that? And I was like, well, what's the origin of Thanksgiving? And they all look at me in, with stunned expressions. And I say, Thanksgiving is a harvest festival, right? It's a celebration of the end of the growing season and filling your stores for the winter. Clearly further north in Canada, that happens earlier than it does in the U.S. And they all go, oh, and they're like, but what do you serve? And I was like, what do you serve at Thanksgiving? And essentially it's the same meal. There's a turkey, there's potatoes. It's all the same sides. I literally make the same meal twice. And then we order Chinese food for Christmas because uh, I'm sick of turkey. But, <clears throat> and then I ch started to challenge them about, well, what goes on? the Thanksgiving table. And I might ask you guys this. So there's that one episode, and I realize that my pop culture references are getting well out of date, but there's that one episode of Friends where uh, Monica makes fa four different kinds of potato because everybody has a particular definition of what kind of potato should be on the table at Thanksgiving. And so we don't make mashed potatoes in our house. My daughters have a very definite idea of what potatoes should be on the table and it's not mashed. So when I invite people to Thanksgiving dinner and they say, what should I bring? Kind of type A in the kitchen. And I don't actually want to give any sort of responsibility to other people because I want certain things on the table. So I am going to make those certain things and put them on the table. So if I say, bring cranberry sauce. My husband likes cranberry sauce with his Thanksgiving dinner, but he wants it out of the can as the jellied cranberry sauce. And so one year, and I opened the can and then I mixed it all up so that you couldn't see the lines of the can. And he got mad. He's like, but you're supposed to see the can shape in the bowl. And I was like, on purpose? Yes. Yeah. So now the trick is to get it out of the can and it still has all the lines on the can. So people say, what, what should I bring? I say, whatever you need to have on the Thanksgiving table. So if they need to have mashed potatoes, they can bring mashed potatoes. If they need to have real cranberry sauce, they can bring real cranberry sauce. And my friend makes cranberry sauce from scratch. And Scott's like cutting into the corn, uh, the can. So it's very, very particular. So perhaps a little bit more relevant to summer upcoming. Fourth of July in the United States is a big deal. What happens on 4th of July. What food needs to be part of 4th of July? Now, I think this picture is really interesting, which I just cribbed off the internet, because there's pizza in this picture. And I'm like, really? Pizza at 4th of July? No, people are shaking their heads. They're like, no, burgers and hot dogs. That is what is served at 4th of July. And so uh, I guess there's chicken there too. I mean, mm. so we have very particular things that we um, think about. As I say, in an international cuisine class is perhaps a um, more broad question than I might get from some other students, but think about your food culture, whether you eat today. Okay, so it's uh, almost 11 o'clock. I've had coffee for breakfast because that's what the morning is all about, right? Um, so whether you eat breakfast, for example, my mother yells at me all the time, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. I said, yes, that's why I'm drinking coffee. But where you eat. So I will admit that I was one of those moms that maintained we must have dinner at the 
dining room table. We ate at the dining room table almost every night. That went out the window at COVID. And now we watch HDTV while we eat dinner. And it's starting to grate on me. <laughs> and so I said, eventually, we are going to eat at the dining room table again. <laughs> how long, how, why, with whom or for whom are you cooking with people, for people? Are they, are, are they allowed to help in the kitchen? Do you cook every day? My husband loves leftovers. Thank goodness I don't have to cook every day. What sort of special things do you make for holidays or festivals? Or perhaps what sort of foods do you avoid, right? There are many cultures that have food taboos that we don't eat. Many cultures define animals that we might not define as food, right? And so the one that perhaps comes to mind is horse, whether that is an acceptable meat to be eating. Um, dog, right? Guinea pig. Those are um, things you find in the pet store here, not in the grocery store. Although if you go down... Um, friend of mine who works in Ecuador and is living in um, LA currently, um, you can find guinea pig in the supermarket there. Whereas if you wanted to eat that here in Michigan, you would have to go to PetSmart and do not tell them why you are buying that guinea pig. What spices and flavors are you using? What regional tastes and traditions, right? All of these um, things that um, impact your food culture. Um, I've worked in restaurants um, several times. I'm a terrible, terrible waitress. But I remember asking chef, what do you make? Like, what do you eat when you go home for dinner? Like, and, and uh, <laughs> this was in Australia. And he said, um, red rooster, which is essentially the Australian version of KFC. And I was like, really? I was like super disappointed that he ate fast food when he went home. And he's like, yeah, but I have great dinner parties. And I was like, okay, well, that's fair. I mean, if you cook all day. <laughs> Perhaps ask your instructors, what did they make when they go home at the end of the day? So an article that I give my students um, that I can summarize into these uh, six key points about food choice. Our food choice is multifaceted. Our food choice is contextual, right? Whether you're eating with friends, whether you're eating with family, what time of the year, clearly what you eat at, um, like I say, Thanksgiving holiday might be different from what you eat every day. It's dynamic in that it changes um, what you defined as, you might have had this experience already of saying, oh, I loved eating this as a kid. And then you eat it and you're like, oh, this is vile. Why did I ever think this was a good choice? I have a peanut sensitivity, so I can no longer eat peanut butter. But I did eat peanut butter. So I, it's not like I've always had an allergy and therefore I've never eaten it. Um, I did used to be able to enjoy peanut butter and I miss it tremendously. But I'm like, when I think about eating a Reese's peanut butter cup and I think, hmm, this could send me to the hospital. Hmm, I might make a different choice, right? It's multi-level, it's integrated and it's diverse, right? If you travel, I say to my students, one of the best things about working in Israel is the food. And I just love the Mediterranean diet um, so much and I love eating there. I found eating kosher very, very difficult. Like the various kosher rules I found very difficult. Don't find them difficult at all anymore. No problem. Love the food there. Um, coffee culture in Israel is fantastic. And of course, as chefs, thinking about those elements of your food choice become even um, more complex as you think not only about um, the food that you are eating, but the food that you are preparing and serving. Um, that was really informative. I mean, I made notes here, writing all kinds of things down. Now I got homework on my own for my own personal satisfaction to do. Um, we have a few more minutes. Does anybody have a particular question? Okay. I was just, uh, I just have, I was just wondering, is uh, soul food like an American type of food? Because I was wondering, because it's developed in the African-American communities, but I really love their flavor state is like, fried chicken and mac and cheese and collard greens and all that is that can we call that actually an american food though well soul food i love that you brought up the um example of soul food because it's getting a lot of attention um now and uh, for instance there's a couple of restaurants i mean i'm in grand rapids so i'm not in a huge urban center but there have been several full soul food restaurants open up recently um in even in grand rapids and i'm sure you know in larger cities as well and it's getting a lot of attention and sort of being a little bit gentrified as in terms of like, you know, the cuisine to be eating. And there's been several articles out about it recently that soul food, the traditional way of talking about soul food is that you're right, it developed in the African-American communities, but even more specifically among 
um, in the history within the history of slavery. And so a lot of the flavors and preparations and foods that are being used in those dishes are how um, enslaved populations made palatable the poor food that they were being given, like the really bad cuts of meat and, um, you know, using that sort of thing. And so, you know, the chefs who are, um, who have that um, history and that connection are really wanting to emphasize, don't take soul food in terms of its flavors and its dishes without also considering the history and, you know, where this food comes from. And certainly in, um, in the States right now with many of our um, important conversations um, to have about race, arguably food, food would be a great way to, I mean, I consider food to be one of the great ways to bring people together. Enjoying soul food, but also recognizing its past is a key part. And, you know, we do this when we borrow culturally, right? We sort of take this, pluck this one part out of a culture without sort of recognizing its connections and its past. And really anthropology is about, you know, considering those components as well. So would I consider it American food? Yes, I probably would consider it American food. And like I say, certainly gaining a lot of popularity and it's delicious, One, you know, definitely to be celebrated, but also to be um, cognizant of, you know, what its roots are. Um, you know, you can't, you can't continually oppress a person and then oppress a group of people and then say, oh, but you have great food or as we've done in the past, oh, but you guys have great music. Um, but we're going to continue to, you know, um, have this structural racism, um, in the community. So, you know, recognizing those connections is, I think is a key part about, about talking about food. I, I do also read that, you know, that they, because, uh, most of the uh, most of these dishes were developed uh, during the slavery period. There aren't really hard and hard recipes because they were in, it was illegal for them to read. So it's I think it has really te tested like to the test of time and like passed down just from my mouth from mothers to daughters yeah. that type um, of. And we're perhaps learning. So again, I'm an archaeologist um, as an anthropologist and. Um, a lot of discussions in archaeology, you know, I've, I've already been critical about, you know, the male perspective in archaeology based on who archaeologists were, but we can be even more critical about archaeology as a discipline in terms of, you know, I'm sure you've heard the theory, <clears throat> it's not even a theory, I'm sure you've heard the conspiracy theory that aliens built the pyramids. <clears throat> Not true, but you can you can see how that perhaps developed because as archaeologists began studying ancient Egypt, the pyramids are kind of cool and people paid a lot of attention to them, right? But the pyramids tell us about one person in society, Pharaoh, and that's it. And now there's been a shift in archaeology to looking at, well, what's everybody else doing, right? And so there are vast excavations in, in Egypt now that are looking at the workers' towns that built the pyramids and excavating those huge things. And it's like, well, who built these pyramids? Well, now we're excavating where people built. And FYI, bakery on every corner, because if you are doing all sorts of manual labor in the hot sun, you need lots of bread. <laughs> um, and the same thing is happening in North America in that there's a lot of excavations that have focused on um, slavery communities and excavating those houses and those communities and as you say if you are talking about a population that has no who's illiterate and has no written record archaeology is one of the key ways that we can find out um, about that community and so my specialty in archaeology is animal bones and so if we want to know what kind of meat people were eating that's what the animals tell us right I mean I sort of end up talking about food because I talk about animals all the time. And um, I end up talking about plants because animals need to eat plants. And um, thank you very on behalf of the class. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, your uh, presentation was a very informative, very fun, fun too, entertaining. So I want to really thank you for being here. And it was a pleasure to, pleasure to have you. Anytime. <laughs>